Were they interesting? Yeah? I see a lot of nods. Were they more interesting than the previous assignments? <laughs> I see more nods. <laughs> or previous required papers that you didn't like, the CM5 paper. <laughs> Think about the paper at the time it was written also. That's, yeah, right now it may not be very new, but at the time it was written, it was very new. That's always a good thing to do when you're reading historical papers especially. Okay, since you enjoyed the review assignments, we'll have more. <laughs> this time it's on multi-threading. Uh, September 20 is not Friday, so that needs to be fixed. That should be September 21st. I'm batching the review assignments, so instead of giving two versus two, uh, two, instead of giving two for each class, I'm going to give four for the entire week. Is that good? Should be fun. These are some interesting papers. I'll just walk you over them. We're going to cover multi-threading. I'm going to go differently this year than last year. After multi-core, we're going to move to multi-threading, and then we're going to move to other stuff. Uh, but the first paper is actually one of the seminal papers. Uh, actually, this is an extended version of uh, Burton Smith's paper that you probably have read if you've taken 740, uh, which is uh, a shared resource pipelined MIMD computer. This was published in an international conference on parallel processing in 1978. And this was one of the first papers that clearly described how to do fine-grained multi-threading. And you all know what fine-grained multi-threading is. And there, it's a three-page paper. I would actually encourage you to read it. I didn't assign this as a review. I assigned the longer version, if you will. Uh, that, uh, but this paper introduced, well, not introduced, but clearly explain fine-grained multi-threading. And there are a lot of other interesting bits here, like full empty bit synchronization that we will talk about, actually, when we get to data flow. Basically, the, the basic idea is you can synchronize at each memory location, and each memory location can have a full, uh, can have a single bit saying whether the memory location is produced yet, is it full, or Nobody has written to that memory location yet. Is it empty? This is a simple synchronization mechanism, right? And one thread can store to a memory location setting the full bit. Another thread can read from that memory location if the full bit is set. And if the full bit is not set when the thread executes a read to a memory location, then the location is empty, which means that that thread waits until the full bit is set. That's a way of synchronizing between memory locations. Now, you can have hardware support for this which this processor uh, had. And this processor was uh, the Nalcor HEP, heterogeneous element processor. It was called, uh, it was built for large scientific simulations. And you had these many threads that were synchronizing on the memory locations. And this was a very simple synchronization mechanism. And the paper, this paper talks about, uh, gives you an example program where you, how, you, how you could write a program using full empty bits. And this is an extended version of that paper. I think it still has a, a more extended example uh, that shows how to do that. There, there are other ideas in this paper that are not described in detail. So this, this processor, or computer, if you will, implemented other things like uh, deflection routing, which we will talk about uh, when we get to interconnects. The idea here is if you have two packets contending in a router, and they need to go to the same output port, well, normally you buffer one packet, right? This processor didn't buffer the packet. It basically, well, it had limited amount of buffers. So if the buffer space uh, ran out, then uh, the what the router did was it took one of the packets and sent it to a destination it doesn't want to go to. It's not destined to. And eventually, hopefully, the paper, uh, not paper, the packet comes back, around, uh, comes back and finds its destination through routing. That's the idea of deflection routing. And this is one of the processors that actually implemented in, uh, in 1978. And this also talks about it a little bit uh, more. So this should be an exciting paper to read, hopefully. It may be a little bit tough to get through because 
some of the papers at that time written uh, with the terminology of that time, right? This is 1981. You can probably calculate how many years ago that was. <laughs> More than three decades. Okay, and then, uh, well, I'll walk you over these. This is one of the papers uh, that made simultaneous multi-threading popular. It's not one of the earliest simultaneous multi-threading papers, but this is one of the better ones. Uh, basically talks about how to design a relatively implementable simultaneous multi-threading processor. And when we get to multi-threading, I'll give you a more history of, uh, when we get to simultaneous multi-threading, I will give you more history of what happened. The earlier paper on this is in ISCA 1995, and there are other earlier papers in ISCA 1992, and hopefully we'll have a discussion of uh, why those papers did not have an impact, whereas this paper had an impact uh, on the industry. Uh, well, why? Because it's so hard to sift through the paper that was written in 1992. There's an ISCA 1992 paper that actually describes something very similar to simultaneous multi-threading but it's very hard to read. So there's one lesson there. If you don't write well, you won't have impact. Uh, even if you have a great idea. And simultaneous multithreading is actually a great idea. Uh, okay, the other paper, <laughs> the other two papers are actually uh, papers that take advantage of the simultaneous multithreading substrate for other purposes. Uh, this one is uh, one of the first papers uh, again, not the first paper, but one of the first papers that introduced uh, how to use uh, the simultaneous multithreading substrate to speed up a single thread. And they discussed how you can actually have uh, threads that uh, produce branch predictions, subordinate threads, micro threads that are not visible to the operating system, that produce branch predictions to aid branch prediction. They discussed the possibility of having threads that prefetch for the main thread. These are more commonly called helper threads now because this is a mouthful to pronounce simultaneous subordinate multi-threading. It's much easier to call them helper threads, right? They're helping the main thread. But the paper has a good discussion on how to actually design such a processor and what you can do with it. And the last one, uh, this is actually one of the first papers, again, not the first paper, uh, that talks about how to use a simultaneous multi-threading substrate, multi have a multiple threads, uh, to do transient fault detection. Are you guys familiar with transient faults? <coughs> yes? No? Well, we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail if we get to it. But when a particle, let's say alpha particle, hits your processor, uh, the state of a wire or a cell can temporarily change to a logical zero or logical one. That's a transient fault. And when this happens, you may get the wrong result, obviously, right? Even if it's temporary, even if it's, if you latch the wrong result, you may get the wrong result. This paper talked about, talks about how to use multiple threads for the same program, basically run two copies of the same program and check whether the results are the same. The hope is that if transient fault hits one thread, it won't hit the other thread. So you'll get a mismatch in the comparison of the result uh, of an instruction. So you compare, the, the processor compares the result of every single instruction. And you can do this very easily, well, relatively easily, on the simultaneous multi-threading substrate because the two threads are executing on the same core. Right? You just need to add some checking logic. Well, it turns out it's not that simple. And this paper has some issues. So the authors later wrote a paper in ISCA 2002 that's much more detailed and fixed some of the issues. But this is probably a good place to start. I would recommend that paper to ISCA 2002 from the same authors. Any questions? It sounds exciting, right? I've already given you summaries. <laughs> I can talk about the benefits and the weaknesses also, but that's your job now. <laughs> Okay. And Friday, the reason I put the Friday as a deadline is so, so that you can hopefully work on your projects during the weekend, right? You have a project proposal due uh, September 25th. So don't forget that. <laughs> okay. 
Last lecture, we covered all of this. We started with multi-core, and hopefully you remember, we covered all of these different alternatives. And hopefully you're thinking of other alternatives because uh, that's the right way of progressing research, right? And today, uh, hopefully we'll cover an early history of multi-core. I'll give you my perspective on how things started and how things converged as people came to their senses a little bit <laughs> after starting. Uh, we'll talk about homogeneous multi-core and uh, we'll talk about where things are headed or where things already are, uh, like asymmetry or heterogeneity in multi-core. And you've already read papers on heterogeneity, right? Three papers that ex exploit heterogeneity in one particular way. So hopefully this will all be uh, basics for you. So this is an early history. It's impossible to cover all of the multi-core processors that are out today. But I'd encourage you to read papers that actually describe these multi-core processors. There are some very good papers uh, that are coming out and that have come out. And I'll point you to some of them. But early on, uh, well, we already covered one paper, S plus 96, right? The, the paper from Stanford that talked about the case for a single chip multiprocessor. But this was another prototype uh, multi-core processor that was developed uh, at what is now extinct uh, digital equipment, Western Research Labs. Uh, and uh, this was an early example of a symmetric multi-core processor. And the goal uh, was uh, to design a large-scale server system. Uh, and it was designed for commercial workloads. So we'll cover some of the characteristics of these commercial workloads soon. But in case you don't have enough to read, <laughs> I'd really recommend these two papers that talk about the characterization of commercial workloads at the time. Uh, this uh, Luis Barroso's paper on uh, memory system characterization specifically of commercial workloads and Partha Ranganathan's paper, paper on performance of database workloads on shared memory ILP processors, basically out of order. And they analyzed the out of order execution and its benefits for these workloads at the time. Uh, and you'll see that similar characterizations are being done today uh, looking at what is called cloud or big data workloads, right? That's okay, so what they did was they, uh, these people from the Western Research Lab uh, analyzed some of these important commercial workloads, which we will get to, basically database workloads, web servers. Uh, these were the two main things. Uh, and figured out that memory system is the main bottleneck. Uh, these workloads... Uh, are dominated by memory stall times, and instruction stalls are as important as data stalls. These workloads are big working sets. Uh, as a result, they get very high cycles per instruction. Uh, and figured out, they also figured out that fast and large L2 caches are critical in these workloads. Uh, and they also found out that very, uh, instruction level parallelism with existing techniques did not provide much benefit for these workloads. Uh, why? Well, a lot of these workloads were decision-making workloads, which meant that they took the data and they checked whether that compared that data is equal to something or is greater than something. As a result, they had a lot of frequent hard-to-predict branches. And if you don't have a good branch predictor, maybe they don't have the branch predictors that we have developed uh, over decades today, uh, you'll get a lot of hard to predict branches. And you know that deep pipelining, a lot of the instruction level parallelism techniques, deep pipelining, out of order execution, large instruction windows, they all rely on whether you can feed useful instructions into the pipeline, right? Otherwise you flush the pipeline all the time. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, you, you, uh, these workloads didn't benefit from these ILP techniques, deep pipelines, uh, large windows, out of order execution. And also because out-of-order execution uh, uh, or large superscalar processing, that also depends on uh, wide superscalar processing, that also depends on your branch prediction accuracy, right? And also these techniques were not efficient in tolerating long latency cache misses. If you're dominated by stalls, you're, you already know that you need very large instruction windows to tolerate that, right? That's not only inefficient, but also maybe very hard to build. That was part, most of our lecture yet last time. So they found these small gains. And they also posited that there is no need for floating point and multimedia units because these server workloads did not do floating point operations or multimedia 
graphics operations. We'll get back to this. Because it turns out there were server workloads that started doing or uh, did floating point operations. And we'll see how Sun changed their mind <laughs> later on. So it's uh, uh, beware of some of these things. They're going to design a system based on these workload characteristics. And once the workload actually changes, or people start changing the workload, if your system is designed for not having a floating point unit, then the, or having a very crippled floating point unit, then your system is not useful anymore. Right? So you've got to be very careful with this kind of system design. And we see some of this published in conferences today also. Uh, OK, so what is Piranha? Basically, they designed Piranha in the end. I'll use uh, Luis Barroso's nice slides that have lots of little fish <laughs> to solve a big problem. That's the basic idea. Why is it called Piranha? These fish are ferocious, if you will. <laughs> they would eat anything alive, and they're very little. <laughs> and you're, we're going to put all of these little things, instead of having a big fish, we're going to put all of these little things together to solve a big problem, which is the commercial workload problem. So they would take an alpha core, a single issue, in order, 500 megahertz at the time, this is, I think, alpha 21164, or maybe 21064. Is that true? Anybody know the alpha history? OK. So they would take the CPU, uh, have L1 caches. Those are important. And connect eight of these with an intra-chip switch. And I think that was a crossbar. And connect L2 cache banks, if you will, that are shared across all of these uh, cores. It was a one megabyte eight-way cache. And then they connected eight memory controllers. You can imagine how costly this chip is, which never saw the day of the light. It was a uh, nice paper chip, if you will. But, uh, but I think they also implemented uh, a lot. But then the Western Research Lab just dissolved, uh, which was a great research lab. It's, it's sad. But yes, they had uh, these memory controllers per core, if you will. Uh, but it wasn't partitioned, as far as I remember. It was ba based on RAM bus DRAM. And they added these protocol engines. Uh, do you guys know what that could be for? One was the home engine, and the other one was the remote engine. No? So this was to facilitate coherence, cache coherence. This is a single chip, and if you add many, many chips, uh, these home engines and remote engines facilitate coherence across these different chips. What would home engine do? We'll cover this in a little bit more detail. And I didn't assign this paper to you, but I would recommend you read this paper too. Home engine basically took the coherence transactions coming from the CPUs and sent them outside. And remote engine, uh, well, it, maybe it's the other way around. I don't remember very well. But one of the engines. Uh, was an interface from this chip to outside. And the, one of the other engines was an interface from the outside to this chip. They would basically ensure coherence. And these were uh, microcode programmable. So if you wanted to change the coherence protocol, uh, you could actually program these engines. They are not processors. You, you need to change the microcode in these systems. And this was the router that enabled that communication, whether it's coherence communication or uh, communication with the I.O. systems. And you can read more about this. And it's all in a single chip. And this was designed circa 19, uh, late 1990s. And if you look at the processing node, this is what it looks like. Uh, I think it's a different way of looking at it from the paper. Mm. And we, we will actually cover in this course uh, pretty much all of these components, not necessarily for this system, but Everything will cover the router design uh, at some point when we get to the interconnects. Uh, but if you want to build a scalable system, this is, as we talked about, the communication, uh, the uh, generic parallel machine. This, is, this looks like a generic parallel machine, right? You have a router uh, that ensures communication. Here you have, it's a shared memory machine. These, this home engine and the remote engine communicates with the router, as well as the processors or the memory subsystem. And you have an interconnect, in, uh, on-chip interconnect, that enables communication between the cores and the caches. Okay, So this was the 
uh, coherence protocol engine that I uh, briefly talked about. Uh, basically, this, this part uh, was microcode programmable. So you could actually change the firmware to change your coherence protocol, what you would do to a packet that comes in. Uh, maybe when we get to coherence, we'll talk about some more, even more programmable coherence engines. Uh, people actually built processors that would do coherence. So you could actually change the coherence protocol. Uh, the, the programmer could change the coherence protocol uh, of the processor that handled it. And I'd recommend you look at this paper uh, to see what the uh, protocol engine is about. I will not go into detail here. But this is good for you to know. OK, so this was, the, this was what the Piranha system looked like. This is the P-chip, uh, Piranha chip, uh, one of these. Uh, was connected like this. You could figure out what topology that is, I guess. Uh, and you also had the I.O. chips that would uh, communicate with the storage. These were the storage nodes. Okay. And this was the I.O. node. I.O. node was essentially uh, a P chip, a processor chip, except you don't have many cores. You have only one core that would handle the I.O. transactions and a PCI X controller that would actually be the interface between the I.O. engine, uh, between the disks and uh, this core. And everything else looks the same. So you can stamp out many of these things, right? That's the beauty of designing a scalable system like this. You can have routers, and you can stamp. As long as you can connect a new node into the system, you can stamp out more P chips and more I.O. chips. OK? So that was Piranha. Uh, that's not a real uh, processor. Well, it's a, it's, it was meant to be real, but it didn't get implemented. But one of the first, uh, it's not the first again, but one of the first uh, multi-core systems that was actually implemented was Sun Niagara, or UltraSpark T1. Uh, that looked very similar to this. It was actually heavily influenced uh, by Piranha. Uh, and you can see what it looks like here. These are Instead of being alpha processors, they're Spark processors. And they're very simple. <laughs> and we'll see the core itself. Uh, and they actually employed four-way multi-threading, except different from Piranha, uh, which is probably a good design decision, assuming you have lots of uh, threads plus memory latency to tolerate. Right? Uh, and if you look here, their L2 cache is shared. And it has four banks in this case instead of eight banks at the, in that case. Uh, in Piranha, and there's a crossbar that enables communication between the cores and the uh, cache. And they had four DRAM controllers. Again, this was a very expensive chip mm. because it, it needed lots of pins. Right? And there, we'll, we'll get to this, but there are some shared functions here, and floating point unit was one of them, an I.O. And I would recommend this paper uh, to you guys. I don't know how many papers per day you read, but <laughs> hopefully <laughs> this will be fun to read. <laughs> and even if you don't read it right away, uh, you can always have this as a reading list. So at the end of this course, you'll get a reading list of I don't know how many papers, but they're all very interesting papers. You can learn a lot from them. OK, what, is the, what does the core look like? The core is a very wimpy core. It's, it's similar to uh, the alpha core, one white. Uh, single issue in order execution uh, alpha core. This is what it looks like, basically. It's, it is a six stage pipeline. In this case, it's dual issue. Uh, it's in order, and it's four way fine grained multi threaded. Uh, and this is the, these are the pipeline stages. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it. I can barely see this. Can you see it from the back? So, so. Would it help if we turn off these lights? in the front? It could? Let's try it. Any idea how I could do this? Uh oh That's the opposite of what I wanted to do. Take notes. <laughs> this is medium. Oh, there you go. Better? OK. So I'm still figuring this out. <laughs> OK. So this is the uh, Niagara core. It's very wimpy. Uh, you can see that, uh, well, where is the 
I, this is the iCache and ITLB, and there are four instruction buffers for the four different threads. And there's the, this is the thread selection logic. And thread selection algorithm was round robin, normally, unless there's a cache miss. If there's a cache miss on a thread, that thread stalled. So you wouldn't select that thread, which means that its slot gets wasted. Right? Uh, and this did not have branch prediction. Uh, and you know what fine-grained multi-threaded means. You can eliminate branch prediction and data dependency checking. Because you have enough threads, you're not fetching from the thread uh, until all of the control and data dependencies are resolved. Right? That enables you to design a pipeline that doesn't have that control or data dependency checking. So this was a very simple design, except it was multi-threaded. So you need four register files. And there's a thread select logic, which you can read more about in the previous, in that paper that I described. OK? Yes? This is a six stage pipeline of four way multi threaded, right? So there can be two instructions depending on each other in the pipeline. That's right, yes. So uh, the, the thing is, execute happens at the end of fourth stage, oh, okay. right? <laughs> yeah, you can forward Exactly, yeah. You can forward the results. It's actually, I think they play tricks also such that. Uh, you can stall the fetch uh, if you figure out that there's another, uh, there's a dependency. So I don't, I don't know the exact details and it's not described. But you can, it's really the execution unit uh, that determines. Because your pipeline can be 100 stages except 90 of them may be dedicated to commit, right? It doesn't matter in that case if your results are already uh, available. But that's a very good question. <laughs> that could be a good exam question. <laughs> OK, so, so this was also designed for commercial applications. Uh, and this, here's a little bit more detail on these commercial applications that they cared about. These are web servers, uh, Java application servers, transaction processing workloads, uh, more enterprise resource workloads, and decision support systems. These are expert systems, for example. Uh, and the, here's a characterization of how much instruction level parallelism they could exploit, uh, how much thread level parallelism these workloads exhibited, high in all cases lots of threads because lots of transactions exist in these workloads. Working set, usually large, big data uh, processing, and how much these threads actually shared the data. Uh, and the reason they went to heavy multi-threading, like four-way multi-threading, if you call it heavy, and lots of cores, is because of this. You've seen this figure many times in my classes, right? Not, not in this exact way. This is copied from that paper. Uh, basically, if you have a single issue uh, core, very wimpy core, uh, single core, this is the performance you would get. The thread would compute, and then you wait for memory. And then a little bit computation, and wait for memory. If you employ out-of-order execution branch prediction, large instruction windows, maybe not too large, this is what would happen. The thread would compute less, but the memory stalls still remain because you cannot tolerate them as well. And the performance improvement is very little. But if you actually do multi-threading on a shared single issue pipeline, this is just the benefit of multi-threading, you could execute three threads and overlap the memory latency uh, with either compute or other memory latencies from other threads. This is the benefit of multi-threading. That way you save significant amount of time because you're executing multiple threads and tolerating latency that way, instead of tolerating latency with instruction level parallelism techniques. Make sense? Okay. So that was uh, Niagara 1. Then, uh, I guess Sun has figured out uh, that uh, they want to build the next core, and they added uh, more threads per core to tolerate that latency. Yes? Oh, because here you use out-of-order execution, branch prediction, that increases, yeah, reduces the computation time. OK, so this is uh, Niagara 2 or UltraSpark T2. Uh, they added more threads to cover more latency. And uh, they figured out, at this point, uh, the, the single floating point unit was actually a bottleneck in their system. There were workloads that people wanted that used this floating point unit. And they added per core floating point units, graphics units, per core crypto units. So this was a much more beefier system. And 
In a sense, one could argue that they made the wrong design decision by keeping the floating point units shared in Niagara 1. Because that system had terrible floating point unit performance. Why? Because they assumed, based on the workloads they had, evaluated at that point in time, floating point units is not important. Well, it was important. And you can see that they increased the size of the cache, I think, to four megabytes. And you can read more uh, on papers written about this. So one thing uh, I would point out, this is essentially a processor with chip multiprocessing as well as multithreading at the same time. So they used a term, which is not that great, but they called it chip multithreading, if you will. And this is a good paper that talks about the term. The idea is not a new idea, but it's a chip multiprocessor where each core is multithreaded. Uh, the motivation for making each core multithread is to tolerate memory latency better. And this is employed in existing systems, like Intel systems today also. But Niagara 1 and 2 and IBM Power 5 were the first to employ it. Uh, IBM Power 5 had simultaneous multithreading. We'll cover that uh, when we finish the Sun approach. Yeah, basically, if you have a simple core that is not multithreaded, it stays idle in a cache miss, and multithreading enables tolerating this cache miss latency much better. Right? When there's TLP, when there's thread level parallels. But there are advantages and disadvantages to this. Right? You, you may not always want to add multithreading. I guess let's cover that a little bit. What are the advantages? I guess I've already given you one advantages, right? advantage, right? You can tolerate memory latency better. What other advantage is there from adding multi-threading to each core, if any. There has to be some, because we're going to cover the space. <laughs> Nothing other than tolerating memory latency? Or do you guys need coffee? <laughs> OK, I'll give you the advantages. You'll tell me the disadvantages. You can simplify core design, right? That's what Niagara 1 and 2 did. There is no need for branch prediction, no need for dependency checking. You have a nice, simple core. And you can potentially better utilize the core cache and memory resources. Why? Because if you are multi-threading, sh shared instructions and data don't get replicated across the cores. And when one thread is not using a resource, another can. But what are the disadvantages of adding threads? Yes? Mm -hmm. That's right. Additional complexity, which translates into more area uh, and more power, probably, because you're running more threads at the same time. What else? Yes? You're sharing your cache with a lot more threads, which may not be sharing the same data. That's right. You can be thrashing your cache. We covered this also last time. Uh, this doesn't always work. <laughs> And you could actually get worse performance, right, if you're thrashing your cache. Let's see what else. Yeah, more, you get more pressure on the shared resources. And you get reduced single thread performance, too. Uh, because a thread does not have the core and L1 cache to itself anymore. It's heavy resource sharing. And when we talk about multi-threading, we'll look at in what ways people try to alleviate these problems. That's why I want to co cover multi-threading next after multi-core. And applications with limited thread level parallelism just do not benefit from this. OK. This is just a limited set of disadvantages. You can think of many other disadvantages also, right? Or advantages, perhaps. Uh, so uh, over time, uh, well, pro because of these reasons, actually, Sun moved to beefier cores, more uh, cores that can actually do more. Uh, to get single thread performance, because they figured out that uh, this was a bottleneck in their system. Regardless of however, again, we go back to Amdahl's law, right? Regardless of how, however parallel your workload is, however much it can benefit from uh, more threads, at some point your single thread performance becomes a bottleneck. And this has been an issue in Oracle for a long time. Oracle has these workloads where you can uh, have uh, bottlenecks, bottleneck portions. Uh, well, now Sun is part of Oracle. That's why I say Oracle. 
Okay, so they actually uh, moved on to a new processor which never saw the light of day uh, because Sun was bought by Oracle after some point. Uh, this is the ROC processor, and I would recommend you to read these papers. Their goal was to maximize throughput when threads are available, but they also realized that there are cases when threads are not available, <laughs> uh, even in these workloads, or when threads are waiting for some other thread, as you read in the papers. Uh, that you were assigned. Uh, so they decided to design a processor that can maximize throughput when threads are available. And if threads are not available, boost single thread performance. Uh, and boost single thread performance on cache misses also, even if threads are available. So they decided to add two ideas into this processor, ROC, and you're familiar with both of them. Uh, well, one doesn't take much branch prediction, right? <laughs> They added branch prediction to uh, Sun Rock. Now, you don't have a simple, simple pipeline anymore. You need to predict branches. To predict and they branches. add a simple G-share. And they add a simple G-share predictor, if you remember from your past courses. Your past courses. What is the key idea in G-share? What is the key idea in G-share predictor? Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> OK, maybe, maybe, he can okay. Maybe, he, maybe he can help you. I mean, past performance is a is a good indication of future behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you've seen it before, you're 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 in cool with this you've ever made. Yeah, that's right. yeah, that's, that's, that's true, but that's, that's not that's a G true, but that's, that's not, not a G share. share. That's not I mean, that's true for all branch prediction schemes, right? Past performance. I will not go into detail, but basically, if you remember branch prediction, you have a pattern history table. That is a table of n bit counters. And I think they use two-bit counters in this case. And I don't know their table sizes. But the basic idea is when you get to a branch, you take the program counter and XOR it with the global history register. Global history register is basically the history of past N branches. Let me, past B branches, let's say. The direction past B branches went. And taking this XOR, they would index this table. And this table would tell them, uh, tell whether the branch should be predictor as taken or not taken. Right? That's the decision, taken or not taken. Make sense? So this is different from a global predictor where you don't do this XORing of the program counter. So this gives you more information. This branch at this history went this way the last time it was seen. It's not only the last time, because this counter has more history, or hysteresis, if you will, uh, that uh, tells you which direction this uh, branch went when the history was this way before. Okay? So they added this uh, G-share predictor, which is a very, very simple predictor. Its accuracy is not very high. <laughs> they also, this likes falling down, huh? Uh, they also added run ahead on cache miss, and hopefully you guys remember that. <laughs> Any idea what that is? <laughs> okay, we'll cover that a little bit more, because I like covering it for some reason. Um, uh, but except they actually improved run ahead, uh, which we will cover briefly also. Uh, they would have two threads, and when, when the main thread gets a cache miss, uh, it's start speculatively executing instructions that are independent of the mess. And there would be a behind thread that would execute the dependent instructions. So a main thread executes independent instructions and defers the dependent instructions because the main thread, remember in run ahead, if you get to a dependent instruction, you mark it as invalid right? and then drop it. Here, we're not going to mark it only as invalid, but we're going to take the instruction and buffer it somewhere saying that these are dependent instructions. And these need to be executed later on. This way, you don't need to go out of run ahead, flush the pipeline, go out of run ahead, and re-execute everything. Here, you, uh, the processor executes only the dependent instructions when their data value becomes available. So they actually found this improves performance more than plain run ahead. Well, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, this is what the system looks like. Uh, they had 16 cores. They added more cores. They reduced the multi-threading per core because they 
wanted to improve single thread performance. So they had two threads per core, uh, which is few, which fewer total, total threads than Niagara 2. So it's 16 times 2 versus 8 times 8. Right? And four cores share the 32 kilobyte instruction cache, and two cores share a 32 kilobyte data cache. It's an interesting system. You can take a look at the papers uh, that I mentioned. The first one is actually an overview of the system. The second one talks about how they implement run ahead plus what other options they have considered. They called it simultaneous speculative threading. And their cache was two megabytes, which is smaller than Niagara 2. So you can see what kind of design decisions they made. They want to improve single thread performance. Uh, so they could tolerate latency better with run ahead instead of multi-threading. So they reduced the threading. And they also reduced the cache size because they now ha had beefier cores that occupied more space. And we'll get back to that uh, again. They reduced the cache size, but they could still get improved performance. OK, you guys remember run ahead? <laughs> I'll cover this very, very quickly. But basically, when the oldest instructions are long latency cache mess, you checkpoint the architectural state and enter run ahead mode. In this mode, you speculatively pre execute instructions. And the purpose is just to generate prefetches. In this case, their purpose is more than that. They don't drop these l 2 uh, instructions, l 2 dependent instructions. They don't mark them invalid and drop them, but they defer them to a spe special queue. And run ahead mode ends when the original miss returns. In this case, they're, they're going to change also. Because run ahead mode, now if you don't drop the instructions, there's no clear end to the mode, right? You can keep going in the speculative thread. And that's what they did. They kept going in the speculative thread. They had two threads. One of them was running ahead all the time until some misspeculation happens and you need to flush the uh, head thread. So it's an interesting design. Uh, so they don't have this. Well, they do have support for this because at some point they need to do that. Uh, and you can read the paper for more details. And just uh, I like going through this again for some reason. But do you remember this, right? Everybody remembers this? <laughs> OK. This is, this is exactly the figure that I showed you in, uh, from that Niagara paper, right? You have compute periods uh, that are followed by stall periods. And one way to tolerate the stall latency is to add more threads. But then that doesn't help your single thread performance. That's what they did in Niagara 2. Uh, and they wanted to improve single thread performance here, so they added run ahead plus plus, if you will. Instead of stalling, you would uh, run ahead, and hopefully you'll get to the next cache miss. Now you can overlap some of these otherwise stall periods. And when you execute the load 2, which was prefetched during run ahead mode, now you don't need to wait anymore. It does, it's not a cache miss. Right? Basically, you overlap these two stall periods within the same thread. And that's the effect they would achieve. And more, hopefully, because they wouldn't have this flush, and they would have two threads, one thread following the other one. OK, I think we're, we've covered this before, but this is for your benefit, uh, if you don't remember it. Anybody want me to cover this again? No? OK. Basically, there are limit. Uh, actually, maybe I will cover the limitations and disadvantages, because they eliminated some of these. Uh, it's still simple to implement, and you get very accurate prefetches. But one of the disadvantages of Warnerhead was extra executed instructions, right? You would flush the pipeline. And they don't need to flush the pipeline for many cases, uh, according to their results. Uh, you're still limited by branch prediction accuracy. You can still cannot paralyze dependent cache misses. And these are still true, I guess. And these are the performance results we reported. You'll, you're going to see that their performance results are similar. This is, a, this is an out-of-order engine. Our results were about 40% uh, improvement on an in-order engine. And SunRock is an in-order processor. So what is different in SunRock? Uh, you have, first of all, it's an in-order engine. So uh, parallelization or run ahead starts uh, when you get a load miss in the L1 cache. Now you start two threads at the same time. Uh, one is the ahead thread. It checkpoints the state and executes speculatively. And instructions independent of the load miss are speculatively executed. And load misses and dependent instructions are deferred to the behind thread. A behind thread, its sole purpose is to take instructions from this deferred instruction queue 
and execute them if they're ready. If they're not, after, uh, well, uh, after they're executed, if they lead to cache misses, it re defers them into the same queue. Because if you have dependent cache misses, what would happen is <coughs> a head thread would not be able to execute one instruction. It would defer it. It would defer a chain of dependencies into, the, into this queue. When the behind thread executes that chain, it would redefer it when, when it is able to execute a cache miss. Right? So this would actually exploit both memory level parallelism uh, because it does run ahead on load miss and generates additional cache misses. But it also exploits instruction level parallelism because what you're doing is a head thread and behind thread are executing independent instructions from different parts of the program in parallel. You could imagine starting this on a cache miss, but it may never end, right? Assuming you're always on the correct path. Okay? And this is what the design looked like. It's relatively simple. Uh, I will not go into detail. You should read that paper uh, that I recommended. Mm. Let's see what's an interesting place. This is the deferred instruction queue. You would figure out whether an instruction is deferred after it's executed. And the first deferred instruction is an L1 cache miss. Why L1 cache miss? Why not L2? Because it's an in-order processor ha that has zero latency tolerance, uh, almost. Other than, actually, they do not employ prefetching also. So it has zero, pretty much zero latency tolerance for cache misses. <coughs> and deferred instruction queue, you have two sources to feed uh, the pipeline. Uh, either the deferred instructions or from the uh, head thread. And if you didn't have any cache misses, then you could actually use these two threads as multiple threads, multiple separate threads. And that's what they did. Okay. So now we have more powerful cores. It's not the wimpy core anymore, right? In fact, even though this, this is still relatively simple, it's much more complex than the wimpy uh, Niagara 1, which didn't have branch prediction, which didn't have dependency checking, which didn't have uh, speculative threading. And in order to support speculative threading, you actually need to support some working register files because you have two threads. Okay. So what are the advantages of this? I think I'll give you this one also. <laughs> Higher single thread performance, and that's what they saw. Uh, and you get better cache miss tolerance as well. As a result, you can reduce on-chip cache sizes. And that's what they did. What about disadvantages? Complex. More complex. That's right. Which means that you have bigger cores, fewer cores, and lower parallel throughput in terms of threads. That's usually a trade-off. When you increase a co single core per, uh, performance, you get less space for uh, the parallel part of the program. And hopefully you've seen that in the papers you read. Well, and pr probably this leads to longer design time as well. These are more complex than Niagara cores, but still simpler than conventional out of order execution. And probably at least longer design time than the more complex Niagara cores. And this may be one of the reasons I, uh, where, uh, why this didn't see the day of light. But this was not the only new thing uh, Sun added to the Rock Core. There was one more feature. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Sun Rock enough. Can anybody tell what, what that could be? We will cover that. And we'll cover forms of it also. No? There are two big features. One is run ahead based design. Branch prediction I would not consider a feature because it, exists, it has been existed, it exists for a long time. The other feature was transactional memory. So they had support for hardware transactional memory. And we very briefly covered this in my previous classes. But we'll go into a little bit more detail. This was the first processor that actually had transactional memory uh, in it. OK. So this is, I think you've seen the slide before. But this is why they, reduced the, they were able to reduce the cache size. Scout is their uh, form of run ahead. And this is just run ahead. There is no speculative threading. Uh, what they found was uh, if you add run ahead, you could reduce the cache size. Basically, this is the constant cache size. You get 40% better performance with a 512 kilobyte L2 cache. But what you could do is uh, 
having run ahead on a one megabyte cache has the same performance of a processor with eight megabyte cache and no run ahead. So you, you buy seven megabytes at this point in space. And here you buy 12 megabytes. So that you could translate to, that's why they can reduce the cache size and make the cores larger. And this is, you, you realize that this is from an earlier talk that they gave. Okay. And this is the performance, very briefly, from this uh, paper that you might enjoy reading, but sometimes it's tough to read. Uh, if you look at this, these are the, some of the uh, commercial workloads, online transaction processing, Java, SAP, I guess that's it. And there were three things. Uh, this is the performance improvement over an in-order processor that just stalls when it gets to a cache miss. Uh, HWS is hardware scout, which is just run ahead. SST is having this additional ahead thread and behind thread mechanism, which doesn't flush the pipeline in a run ahead and, uh, on a, uh, when the uh, load comes back. Uh, and this is their version of out of order execution. And I don't remember the exact parameters, but uh, these results show that uh, we run ahead by some performance, but if you actually have these two threads, you get bit even better performance. Yeah, even better performance. And the comparison point is and out of order execution, point out of order execution which, doesn't as well as which doesn't do as well as their mechanism. Uh, their mechanism. Why? Why? Anybody venture? Anybody venture? I guess. That could be one reason. That could be one reason. And there's, and there's, there's a limited window. There's a limited window. Right. You cannot tolerate all the memory. You cannot lanes. tolerate all the memory lanes. That these other techniques. That these other tolerate. techniques and tolerate. So what would the what would the question so you would the, ask the, the author? These are simulation results. These are simulation results, by the way. These are, results, the way. These are not results. real hardware results. What would you ask them to simulate? What would next? you ask them to simulate <laughs> next? If you were me. <laughs> Bigger window could be one. Bigger window could be one. Say it again. Say it again. Yeah, that could be another thing. Yeah, that's that right. could but be another that's thing. That's right. But that's applicable to, to, to others also. Right. This that could be another thing. That could be another thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That would be a fair comparison, right? If uh, if they had out of order with run ahead, they would give us a lot more information about what would happen because out of order execution. It has a known problem. If you have a limited window, you're not going to tolerate the latency, uh, long L2 cache miss latency. If they had here out of order plus the hardware scout, the same mechanism they have, that would be much more interesting here because that doesn't add too much more complexity to the out of order engine. And who knows where it will be. So this is something when you do your projects, be comprehensive. <laughs> okay. But this is still interesting data to see uh, how these different techniques, uh, and that's exactly why they employed SST or simultaneous speculative threading. Uh, but now you can see that what, what, what Sun started out before I moved to IBM's Power 4, where Sun started out was very wimpy cores that were not good, uh, single thread, uh, not good for single thread performance. And what they ended before they got bought by Oracle uh, was a much more powerful core. It's not in order execution anymore. It's, it's better than out of order execution according to this. So it's not a simple core anymore. Let's take a look at another design space. Um, IBM is another uh, company that started out, actually earlier even, um, to put multiple cores on the same chip. And Power 4 is one of the first processors that was actually designed to be multi-core. And this is a great paper. I think it's 36 or 40 pages uh, that talks about Power 4 system microarchitecture. IBM has a lot of great papers in the Journal of Research and Development where they actually explain their processors or systems uh, nicely. Unfortunately, they made the, this used to be all public and free. Now they made this part of IEEE Explore. And it's not, uh, you don't get it with the regular IEEE Explore membership. You need to pay extra for some reason. Uh, so I don't know if CMU has that membership. Maybe one of you who has a computer can check 
whether they can access this paper from IEEE Explore. Uh, but we should put it up uh, regardless. This, uh, I, would, I would very much recommend you to read the Power 4, Power 5, Power 6, and Power 7 papers that were published <laughs> in this uh, Journal of Research and Development. So this was, a, this was another symmetric multi-core chip, but it was exactly the opposite approach. Uh, they built very large cores instead of taking the Sun Niagara approach. And they were designing for kind of similar workloads, maybe not exactly, but this is still server workloads. Uh, but they wanted very high single thread performance also. I guess we could speculate on why. Maybe they knew better, but <laughs> we, I, we, let's not get into that at this point. Uh, so this was what the system looked like. Basically, this is a large out of order engine. I guess we can look at this. They had two cores, out of order execution. So they didn't have eight cores because they didn't have uh, space for it. If you build large cores, you cannot have many cores. And they had 100 entry instruction window in each core. Eight wide instruction fetch, each you execute. This was one of the widest processors that was built. Uh, large local plus global hybrid branch predictor. Hopefully you know what that means by now. Uh, still large L2 cache and aggressive prefetching to tolerate the memory latency. So this is like a beast, right? That's a very <laughs> heavy, multi, uh, heavy, heavy processing engine. Uh, and it's exactly the opposite approach. I'll not cover this in more detail, but I, I'll refer you to that paper. That paper describes all of these in nice detail. And then in the next design, they added uh, multi-threading as well. Now it's a simultaneous multi-threading engine uh, because you have out of order execution and you could simultaneously issue instructions from different threads into uh, the different execution units. And they added two threads. This is power five. Uh, as you can see what resources are shared, you can see what resources are shared versus partitioned. Of course, you need to have two program counters. And you can alternate between the two program counters uh, every cycle, unless one is stalled. And you have instruction buffers separate for each. And you have a thread priority logic that determines which one, which thread you ish send instructions or decode instructions from. And they had adjustable priorities in this, which we will cover when we talk about multi-threading. So you could adjust the priority of one thread uh, to be zero, another thread to be seven, uh, such that you would almost always issue instructions from the higher priority thread. Mm. And they, uh, I guess if you remember what return stack is, they, rep, uh, they had two different return stacks for different threads. You can, you can think about why that is the case, but we will cover this in more detail when we get to simultaneous multi-threading. Okay, and they had separate store queues and separate reorder buffers. IBM calls this the group completion table rather than reorder buffer, but that's what it is. It's really a reorder buffer uh, at the back end of the pipeline. Okay, and then the next step they took was actually to simplify the cores. And this is the power six uh, microarchitecture, and this is also another very nice paper. Uh, what they did was, instead of having this very beefy core with multi-threading, uh, actually this shouldn't be simultaneous, but that's okay, I guess. We're gonna fix that. Mm. Instead of having a beefy out-of-order core, they actually moved back to in-order execution, this core. Except their design point has become similar to Sun because they did have run-ahead execution in each core also, similar to Sunrock, and this actually is a process that it exists. Uh, I guess this shows the difference between power five and power six. They say ultra high frequency power six core. They had, so they decided to increase the frequency of each core, reduce out of order execution, add run-ahead to tolerate memory latency, and they still kept the simultaneous multi-threading. And they still had the eight wide fetch, but it was in order in this case. So it was in order execution. Does that make sense? And I'd encourage you to read this paper also. They increase the sizes of the caches also to tolerate the memory latency better. But now the design point is becoming similar to Sunrock. Right? And 
Uh, they moved back to out of order after this, which was interesting. Uh, but this is power 7. Now they, uh, I guess they can do it because they have the resources. They had eight out of order cores in their last design. This kind of breaks my analogy. <laughs> I don't like it that much, but I have to give it to you because <laughs> this is a real system. Uh, they moved from uh, two cores in order, high frequency, eight out of order cores, four way SMT in each core, still high frequency. Uh, and they added this turbo core mode, which we will talk about. You can actually turn off cores so that other cores can run at a higher frequency. Because you have limited power budget, you cannot run everything at the highest possible frequency that you could run cores at. So you turn off some of the cores so that you can distribute that power to uh, one or more cores that can run at even higher frequencies. Yes? Yes. So, so you mentioned that uh, these, are, these are primarily uh, developed to run server uh, workloads. Yep. What's different about a server workload that I guess an uh, architect at IBM or Sun would need to think about versus? That's a, that's a good question. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, in, I think in, these, uh, cases, in, in IBM, these cases, uh, IBM uh, designed processes uh, design for places like Wall Street, right, banking, where you need very high performance. And there, uh, the latency response time of a single thread is very, very important. I think Sun was less concerned about that kind of market. Their market was more online transaction processing uh, or web server, where uh, the speed of a single transaction is not as important. The throughput is more important across a lot of transactions, but the speed of a single transaction is not as important. Whereas you can think of a transaction at a bank, a critical transaction. Maybe this is not the best possible example, but uh, mm, let's say you're trading stocks and you want to make a decision very, very quickly. The response time was that single thread needs to be very fast. And some of these processors were actually had big customers from that market. And if you look at uh, like IBM Z series is another one. Uh, we, we, I did not cover this, but some of those processors are extremely expensive, the systems. People, uh, so that's, that's the uh, major difference. But uh, in the end, I think the lesson is, if you want to run more applications, you don't want to limit yourself to a particular workload. And I think IBM, that's what they're trying to do with actually building beefier cores, faster cores, as well as multi-threading. In a sense, they're all out. Of course, it comes at a disadvantage, which is it's very expensive. I don't, think you're, I don't think any of us are running <laughs> uh, IBM Power 7 in our laptops. <laughs> OK, but I'd recommend you to read this paper also. OK, so what's the uh, point in all this? Uh, IBM Power 7 kind of uh, changed the flow of my lectures <laughs> after coming. But if you look at the Sun started with a very small course and made the course beefy. IBM started with very complex cores. And if you, do, if you ignore Power 7 for a while, they made the cores simple, but they preserved the performance of those single cores. And there are two, these are two different approaches, if you will, even though in the end they converged. But they're trying to achieve something, uh, something that can be achieved in some other way, perhaps. And we're going to talk about that something, hopefully. And that something is heterogeneity. Basically, what they're trying to achieve is good single thread performance as well as good parallel performance. And the question is, how do you get that? If you look at a large core, all of these things that we've talked about, and some of which we have not talked about, perhaps, uh, these techniques to extract single thread performance comes at a price. The core becomes large and power hungry. If you have a small core, you don't, need, you don't have good single thread performance, right? You're in order, narrow fetch, shallow pipeline, simple or no branch predictor, few functional units. And this is not good for single thread performance, but if you have massive parallelism, this is great because you can have many of these small cores. And it turns out these large cores are power inefficient because they want to extract all the single thread performance. Uh, and this is uh, Polak's rule. Uh, the area. Uh, and this is based on a lot of processor designs that Intel had over years. And what they 
figured out is they plotted the area versus the performance you get, single thread performance you get. Uh, I guess area of the chip, area of the core, uh, core area versus single thread performance. And they found out that single thread performance uh, grows as the square root of the area. It's called Pollack's rule, Fred, uh, named after Fred Pollack, an Intel fellow. Uh, this, this would be nice, of course, if you could scale to infinity, right? <laughs> what is the square root of infinity? <laughs> but that probably is not the case. Uh, but it, we're going to assume that you get 2x performance uh, for 4x area. And this is some real data. Uh, well, again, Intel data. This is one of the Intel's uh, papers, one of the earlier papers that looked started looking at heterogeneity, best of both latency and throughput. Uh, just to look at this, uh, if you have a large core out of order with 128 to 256 entry order buffer with a width ranging from two, 3 to 4 and a pipeline depth that's 20 to 30 versus a small core that's in order, 1 wide, 5 deep, 5 stage deep, if you look at the performance of this, this is 5 to 8x. I don't know how they came up with it, but that's, um, this is based on some workload analysis. The power of this large core is 20 to 50 times the small core. So now you can imagine the trade-off you're making, right? If you have the same power budget, either you have one of these beefy cores or 20 to 50 of these large, small cores. And the normalized energy per instruction uh, which takes into account how long you take uh, to process that instruction is better than power. It's 4 to 6x. So you spend a lot more energy per instruction with this core. But you get higher performance also. So one approach uh, is to have these large cores and tile fewer of them, right? IBM Power5, AMD, Barcelona, Intel, a lot of the Intel processors have this approach, right? You have these large cores and tile them together. The benefit of this is you get high performance on single thread and serial code sections, but you get low throughput on parallel program portions. Right? I'll, I'll cover this relatively quickly so you can, you can examine the numbers, but the assumption is that with four units area, well, I guess I'll, I'll give you the comparison point. This is the tile small approach. You get 16 small cores, and this is how Sun started with. Uh, Intel Larrabee was an example of this, and Tylera's Tile processor is an ultra-small processor that's even, even more wimpy than the small cores we've examined. This way you get high throughput on the parallel parts, 16-unit performance, assuming you get one unit performance from each core, but you get low performance on the serial part, single thread, only one unit, right, because you cannot run it on many cores. But we will look at approaches to parallelize a single thread to run on many cores. And we'll see how not so successful have they have been so far. Um, the other approach is this, which is fewer large cores. You get two unit performance on the serial part, because this is 4x the area of the small core. But you get low throughput on parallel program portions, right? eight units. But you could, of course, add multi-threading, which we will cover. Uh, so this is just to summarize the benefit. So in tile small, one of the big downsides is you get reduced single thread performance compared to existing single thread processors. And that's usually not a good trade-off to make. That's, that's, that's the reason why IBM did not move to smaller cores, Intel or AMD. None of those companies are uh, taking the bet to move to a smaller core that performs worse than an existing core that they have today. Because if you do this now, existing programs will run slowly. And existing programs arguably are already slow. But you want them to be slower then. You will lose significant market if you, if you make that move. Well, can we get the best of both worlds? So hopefully you know the answer right now after reading those papers. Basically, you can have both large and small on the same chip. Right? You can have performance asymmetry. And this already exists. Uh, these slides are older than, well, at least an earlier version of these slides are older than when these things existed. Right now we have CPU and the GPU on the same chip. Right? You could consider that 
a form of asymmetry, except it's really different ISAs. It's not really performance asymmetry. Right? You cannot flexibly migrate uh, threads from the CPU to the GPU. But that will happen too. <laughs> OK, but let's take a look at uh, the asymmetric chip multiprocessor, asymmetric multicore. The basic idea is provide one large core or n large cores and many small cores. Now we can accelerate the serial part. If you have a single thread, you never lose performance. Right? It's still two units. And you can execute the parallel part on all cores for high throughput. And if your large core is not multi-threaded, you get 14 units. Right? And if you can multi-thread this, that's even better. right? You can hopefully get 16 units at that point. So you don't lose performance on serial part. You don't lose performance on parallel part. What might be even more interesting, just to uh, give you um, maybe a project idea, is why do it this way? Like, why not have multi-threaded cores that can act as a large core when you need single thread performance, and that can add, act as multi-threaded small cores when you need parallel performance? So this figure could be like this, right? It's more dynamic. And that's one of the research areas that people are working on. Let's see. So you have large cores, but they can be also multi-threaded dynamically, and you can switch between serial and parallel modes very quickly. Right. You can switch between single-thread mode and multi-thread mode very quickly. That sounds reasonable, right? Now you are even more flexible. You don't dedicate. You design a single core that can switch between these two modes of operations. You don't need to design two different cores. That's one advantage of that approach. And people are looking into this approach uh, going into the future, and it makes sense. The downside, what is the downside, I guess? I'll ask you. Hopefully you will. <laughs> give the answer. <laughs> give the answer. There's a clear downside to this kind of design versus this kind of design. Yes. Yes. It will be complex. The, the large design will be more complex because you have to support the multi-threading also. So in the in the budget you mentioned that we supported a multi-thread. We didn't care about the bypass network and things like that. Uh -huh. uh, but here we have to support the branch breaker and all the complexity for the and as well as support the hardware That's right. The core will be a little bit that's more right. complex. That's right. The core will be a little bit more complex. That's right. And that's true. And that's true. There, there's another downside. There, there's another downside. <laughs> but that's true. That's a valid point. But that's true. That's a valid point. Think about performance. What would Think about performance. What would happen to performance in the parallel versus serial part? Compared to this design. Compared to this design. Would the, would the, the parallel performance would the of parallel this performance of this core be core the same be as the parallel performance the same as the parallel performance of this? Maybe. Maybe. What about serial performance? What about serial performance? Which one would be better? Which one would be better? No. No. Say it again. Say it again. Before serial? Before serial? I guess that's something. I guess that's you still something. have a shared cache. You can still have a shared cache here, right? If you have a single thread. If you have a single thread. Yes. Yes. You can even more performance by specializing mm -hmm. in the same area. Because um, we we're getting the extra thread. Of what that's right. That's what I was looking for. Actually. That's what I was looking for. Actually, here, here, you can really specialize for really just for single thread performance. Just for single thread performance. You can optimize all of the paths in the design for that. But here, you need to support this extra thing, which is multi-threading, which adds uh, additional logic to your critical paths. However, you design it, you will lose some performance. That's the specialization. You're really specializing this large core for single thread performance here. Okay. So the question remains to be seen if you actually can design cores that lose reasonably 
little performance that can achieve this. But there's a big advantage also, which is you don't need to design two separate cores here. <laughs> okay. Okay, how do you accelerate serial bottlenecks? You already know this very well, I think. Single thread. If you have single thread, execute on the large core. And those cache issues remain still in both uh, systems. Unless you dedicate the large core just for a single thread. Right? Then you keep the, uh, hopefully keep most of the working set here. Okay, I think we've covered this, but assuming that small core takes an area budget of one and has performance of one, and large core takes an area budget of four and has performance of two, this is a summary of what I uh, gave you. And if you multi-thread the large core, you hopefully get 16 for parallel throughput. I'll leave this with you. So some people have done analysis on multi-core chips. This is one paper uh, that I would recommend you to read. Uh, it's extended Amdahl's law to asymmetric multi-cores. Uh, I'll briefly cover the, some of the interesting analyses in the paper. Basically, you can think of each chip to consist of n base core equivalents, and base core equivalent is a small core. Uh, if you have one RBCE core, R base core equivalent core, that means it's a more beefy core, right? More, more expensive, larger core. That leaves you n minus R base core equivalents, and you can spend that budget somehow. Uh, so let's say you have one beefy core and n minus R base co uh, smaller cores. Then you can have 1 plus n minus r total cores. Right? And if you look at n equals 16, uh, and if your large core is 4 uh, times the small core, if that's what you decide r to be somehow, this is what a symmetric 4 large cores would look like. And this is what an asymmetric 1 large core, 12 small cores would look like. This is a different way of drawing the same figure that drawing I figure uh, drew in a different picture. Uh, drew oh. in a different picture. Oh, that looks interesting. <laughs> that looks interesting. <laughs> that does happen with PowerPoint. That does happen with PowerPoint. Wow. It is repeatable. Wow. It is repeatable. <laughs> so how do we fix it? At least so I know the fix, fix here. At least I know the fix here. Let's see if I actually do Let's know the fix here. We're testing. It worked. We're testing. <laughs> it worked. So you can develop? So you can develop? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> there you go. How do I get rid of this? How do I get rid of this? Oh. Oh. I want to reopen it. I want to reopen it. Okay. Okay. A minor disaster is avoided. Minor disaster is avoided. <laughs> okay. So you can modify okay. MDOS so law to take into account this kind of system. Uh, system. Serial fraction yeah, is one minus f. Parallel fraction is f. Now you can your now serial you can, speed up your serial increases, speed increases up depending increases on the performance of the large core, core, right? Because you're going to execute the. Uh, serial part on the large core. And this perf r gives the performance of the large core, uh, this is basically an equation. And the parallel part is sped up by this amount. Instead of dividing it by n, we now divide it by one core speeds up uh, the performance of one thread by perf r, and everybody else speeds up the performance by n minus r, because you have n minus are of those cores. Does this make sense? The assumption is that uh, you can actually parallelize work on the large core if it uh, keeps speeding up. And this is the Amdahl's equation modified. It's not rocket science, it's simple. And let's, let's plot, they, so what they did was they took this equation and plotted it for different values of R. And they fixed N to 256 base core equivalents. So you could have uh, I think this is the case where, so one means every core is equal and small. Basically, you have 256 cores in this case. Right? And 256 means this is the size of the large core. You have a single core with 256 base core equivalent size. And this is the total number of cores, 1 plus 256 minus r. If you plug r equals 256, you get one enhanced core. Right? If you plug r equals one, you get 256 small cores. Right? Which means, in, that, in this case, base is same as the enhanced. 
And this is the speed up curve you would get for different values of parallel portion, parallel fraction. This is a very simple analysis. And the assumption here for perf r, that's the question you should ask, what is perf r, right? <laughs> and the assumption here is the square root law. So performance uh, r is square root of r, which may not be true if you go to 256 rate. Right? That would be nice, actually, if we could, if we could know how to scale performance that nicely. Like if you had 1,024 base core equivalents and you would get, uh, what is square root of 1,024? I picked a terrible number. What is it? Can, can people do it? <laughs> 32? Oh, is it 32? Okay. Oh, I need coffee, I guess. <laughs> okay, 32. That would be nice, I guess. Because <laughs> 32x single thread performance is good. <laughs> but let's assume that anyway. Uh, if you look at this, even for a parallelization value of 0 0.999, which is a very high parallelization value, the performance peaks around here. Right? The performance doesn't peak at wimpy cores, if you will. The performance peaks somewhere around here, which is uh, you need to have one large core with, I don't know, five or six or maybe eight base core equivalents. That's a very high parallelization value. Of course, if your parallelization was one, where would performance peak at? Right here, right? <laughs> but one is very hard to achieve. So if you go to 0 0.99, you quickly <laughs> shift the curve here, which means that you've got to have a beefy core, much beefier. Remember, this is a, dependent on the assumption of perf r, of course. Uh, if perf r was growing lower than square root of r, then these curves would shift to the left, right? The peaks would shift to the left. Uh, and if you have a parallelization value that's terrible, like half of your program is parallelizable, then you'd better have a huge core. So this is all expected. But this is the asymmetric uh, multi-core chip. They also plotted, this is a symmetric multi-cores. What is the performance of symmetric multi-cores? So this is where you have one enhanced core that is arc base core equivalent. Here, you have symmetric multi-cores. All cores are equal, and each core has R base core equivalent area. And this is the performance curves you would get. So if you are almost perfectly parallelizable, you're better off with very simple cores, if your cores are symmetric. You see the difference, right? If you had asymmetry, you're better off here. And the performance here you get is much higher than 200 blip. Here it's more than 220, right? Whereas here, 200 blip, 200 plus epsilon. <laughs> and even symmetric multicores, other than this very heavily parallelizable program, you're better off having beefier cores, as you can see. Right? So let's take a look at it. If your f is 0 0.9, here, the symmetric one, this should not be recalled. Uh, your R is 28, and you get nine cores, and your speed up is 26.7. So you, you just want to have nine cores that are 28 core, base core equivalents. If you have asymmetric, if your F is 0 0.9, your R should be, best R is 128, uh, 118 versus 28, if you're symmetric, and you get 139 cores versus nine. So asymmetric is better, right? And speed up is 60, approximately 66 versus 27. That's a huge difference. Again, this depends on the performance R assumption, but you can actually draw the curves with different performance R. Basically, asymmetric multicore provides much better speed up than symmetric multicore when N is large, and also when F is lower, F grows lower. But even when F is, uh, well, n is large. n is fixed in this case, so we're not varying n, but you could imagine varying n also. Uh, even when f is very high, asymmetric performs better. So for example, uh, when f is 0 0.99, uh, this is the asymmetric r versus symmetric r. This is the number of cores you get asymmetric versus symmetric, and the speed up you get asymmetric versus symmetric. 166 versus 80. That's a big difference. OK. So while we're at it, we can talk about the advantages and disadvantages of asymmetric. Of course, I'll give you the advantages 
So when thread level parallelism is limited, obviously you can get better performance. This could also be more energy efficient, right? You could try to schedule computation on the core that's best suited for it. What are the disadvantages of asymmetry? Well, we've talked about some of them, so I'll go through quickly, I guess. There are a lot of disadvantages to it, too. First, you need to design more than one type of core. I guess, is that true always? Well, this would hopefully fix that problem. Hopefully fix that problem. But there could be other cases where, there could you, be other cases where you may not need to design that may core. Not need to design that core. Can anybody think of? Can anybody think of? I see. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's. Uh, that's true. Uh, if you could do that's that. That's true. If you could do that. <laughs> so the suggestion is that you can the have start with smaller have, cores with and smaller somehow cores. add glue logic to put them together and make them operate uh, as a single core. That still requires modifications, a lot of modification to the core, though. But yes, that's another way of doing it. It turns out that's very complex to implement. It's a great idea at the very high level, but if you go to the guts of the, uh, to make it work, taking together wimpier cores and somehow making them work as a single core at high performance, it becomes very, very difficult. But there, is, there are some cases where you don't need to design the core at all. Say it again. Yeah, that's not perfectly asymmetric. That's another way of achieving asymmetry. But that's right. You can increase the frequency and voltage, but that's not what I'm thinking about. In that case, you're not. Uh, uh, here, uh, I'm saying you have two different types of cores, but you don't need to design one of the cores. I guess you're all. <laughs> that could be true. That's right. <laughs> but I'm thinking uh, you have two different types of cores, microarchitecturally also. <laughs> Well, I'll give you the <laughs> answer. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> what if you already have the cores, right? <laughs> you could use, I don't know, Intel 386 as your small core, right? You already have the designs. And we'll cover a, a paper that looked at that soon. So this may not be that hard. Of course, you, you lose something because you don't redesign the core, but that, that may be OK to begin with. Because these are cores that are designed for parallel performance anyway. right? Maybe you design the large core, redesign the large core, but s smaller cores you don't need to redesign. Okay. So scheduling becomes more complicated. Now you have a choice of what computation should be scheduled on the large core, who should decide, hardware and soft or software. And you read papers that talk about how to do it somewhat cooperatively. Uh, and managing locality and load balancing can become difficult also when threads move between the cores, right? And again, you read papers that try to overcome some of those issues in a parallel application. And cores now have different demands from shared resources, which we may get to. Now you have heterogeneous cores, and if one of them is very hungry for bandwidth, you need to design your shared resources such that they can accommodate for these different needs. If you have a CPU and GPU especially, uh, it turns out that you can have many CPU cores and you can have a big GPU core. If they share the caches or the memory controller, because GPU has lots of memory level parallelism, it can hog the memory subsystem and it can deny service to these smaller, relatively smaller CPU cores. And the question is how do you actually design these shared resources to accommodate both needs? Okay. I guess we still have a lot of time. <laughs> uh, one thing we did not talk about is how to achieve asymmetry. So far, I have assumed that you designed this large core. Right? That's one way of achieving asymmetry. Uh, that's a static type of asymmetry. Your type and power of cores are fixed at design time. Uh, and there are two approaches to design these faster cores. Uh, you can actually do diff use different technologies, one of you suggested. You could have high frequency, statically set high frequency for some of the cores. Or you could have a more complex, powerful core with entirely different microarchitecture. I would argue that this is better, but we'll talk about that. Uh, and there's also, uh, potentially, you can exploit the 
variations that happen across the chip uh, because of process variations. Uh, your different parts of your chip can be operated at different frequencies. Uh, so asymmetry, some sort of asymmetry may be natural in existing generations of chips. Right? You can perhaps exploit that. There's also maybe a more powerful way of achieving asymmetry. You can change the type and power of cores dynamically. And that's what this example was about. Uh, this example was not, actually it's going to be published soon, but uh, there are other approaches to create faster cores. You can boost frequency dynamically. Right? And you could do that. You can do that today, right? IBM Power 7 that I described can do this. Intel, Nehalem can do turbo boost. You could boost the frequency of a single core. That's one way of achieving dynamic asymmetry. Right? Uh, you could combine small cores to enable a more complex, powerful core, as you suggested. Uh, and we may or may not cover this. I traditionally covered that in this course, but maybe I'll just uh, give you the paper to read in this, this time. Are you guys interested in looking into this? How you can combine smaller cores to act as a large core? Not much excitement. <laughs> this is a hard problem. If you solve it in an implementable way, that would be good. And maybe there are third, fourth, or fifth approaches, and I've given you one here. So one of the uh, first works that I covered, I did not assign this as a paper. Well, I guess let's look at this. You can, one way of achieving asymmetry is boosting frequency. Right? And as I said, this could be static or dynamic. Basically, you can simply hardwire some cores to have high frequency, hardwire other cores to have low frequency. Uh, or due to process variations, do this hardwiring by taking advantage of those process variations. But one of the earlier papers on heterogeneity actually looked at dynamic boosting of frequency. And this eventually, this is a paper from Intel, and it affected the designs at Intel. Uh, and they called it mitigating Amdahl's law through EPI throttling. And they took advantage of the fact that you have dynamic voltage and frequency scaling in existing systems. Their goal was to minimize execution time of a parallel program while keeping power within a fixed budget. Uh, and the way they wanted to achieve this was to change energy per instruction. I'll give you the equation, but the basic idea will be the same as what we've discussed so far. Uh, for a fixed power budget, run the sequential phases on a high EPI processor, a processor that has high energy per instruction, a large core. But there are many other ways of uh, achieving this high EPI and run parallel phases on multiple low EPI processors, processors that expend less energy per instruction, simple cores, or lower frequency. Right? Why? Well, you have fixed power budget, right? Power is equal to energy per instruction times instructions per second. That gives you energy per second, which is what power is. Uh, and you have fixed power budget. You can vary these two things, right? You can have a processor that expends a lot of energy per instruction versus uh, a processor that expends less energy per instruction uh, and has high versus low instructions per second, right? Okay. You can read the paper for more analysis. Uh, okay, so what they did was they took the dynamic voltage and frequency scaling uh, that exists in these processors. And in phase of low thread parallelism, they could run a few cores at high supply voltage and high frequency. And in phases of high thread parallelism, they could run many cores at low supply voltage and low frequency. So this way, you can achieve an EPI range like this. Basically, you can have cores that have an EPI of 1 to cores that have an EPI of 4, just by varying the frequency and voltage. Does that make sense? So you could achieve better performance or higher energy per instruction by varying the voltage and frequency. And they also looked at asymmetric cores. They did not evaluate it. You could get uh, their, uh, their uh, this is data they suggested. They never evaluated it. But they said that you could actually achieve a higher EPI range with large core versus small core. 
What does that mean? Basically, large core can deliver higher performance than just boosting the frequency. Right? You spend more energy per instruction. Uh, and I, I would also recommend you to read that paper, this paper also. They also look at time to alter EPI. What does that mean? Time to change uh, from one core to the other core. If you, uh, time to change the voltage and frequency. If you want to change the voltage, it takes time. It's 100 microseconds at the time when this paper was written. If you want to move from one core, one small core to a large core, that's much less, 10 microseconds, according to their calculations here. Uh, so these are the actions you would take from moving from one, core, one EPI state to another EPI state. Uh, here you could lower voltage and frequency. Here you would migrate threads from the large core to small core, or vice versa. Or you could design a variable size core. Uh, in this case, their design was not exactly like this, what I described here. But you take an out of order processor and you could vary the size of the structures. For example, you could uh, start with uh, a processor that has 256 registers and you could dynamically vary how many registers you enable. Right? That would also change the power characteristics of the core. Right? That would make the core beefier or smaller uh, dynamically. And there, uh, in that case, the EPI range is not as high. So you would reduce the capacity of processor resources. And there's some, but the time to alter that EPI is much smaller. Right? Because you're just varying how many registers you have. It just takes time to move the register somewhere. Speculation control is another approach. This has even lower EPI range, but this is another thing you could do. What is speculation control? We briefly talked about this, right? If you know that your processor is the wrong path, or if you can predict that if your processor is not on the right path, you can reduce the speculation you do. And how could you figure this out? You could have confidence values associated with each control flow instruction. The processor, when it predicts a branch, it doesn't exist here anymore. It went somewhere up. <laughs> but when it predicts a branch, it not only uh, supplies a branch direction prediction, but it also supplies how confident it is in this prediction. And if it's not confident, which means that the last time or the last few times it this branch was predicted, or the last many times this branch was predicted, it was mispredicted, then the processor can say, oh, I'm not confident in this prediction. And if you have many of these not confident branches in the pipeline, not confident branch predictions in the pipeline, you could at some point say, oh, I'm going to stall fetch because I'm likely on the wrong path. This is called speculation control. Uh, and that way, you can reduce the amount of energy spent in the pipeline because you're not feeding many instructions into the pipeline. Right? But that's a much uh, less effective way of reducing or varying the energy per instruction. But you can control this at a very fine grain. You can, change, you can basically stop the pipeline in, I don't know why it's 10 nanoseconds, but it's probably even less than that right? You can, if you stall fat, fetch. I guess if your processor frequency uh, cycle time is 10 nanoseconds, yes, then it's 10 nanoseconds. <laughs> okay. So you could uh, achieve EPI throttling in many different ways. I guess we're running out of time. But one way of achieving is frequency boosting. And this was implemented on Intel and the Halem and IBM Power 7. And the paper we're going to continue talking about is uh, a, pre a predecessor of what happened to Intel and the Halem. But there are advantages and disadvantages of this, this way of dealing with heterogeneity. Okay, so I'll give you the advantage. It's very simple to implement. It already exists almost, right? If you have DVFS in a core, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, you can do this right away. There's no need to design a new core. Uh, parallel throughput does not degrade when thread level parallelism is high, because you still have all the cores. You just need to adjust your frequency adjust and your voltage. Frequency. And it preserves the locality of the thread, right? You don't need to move the threads. Thread, right? You don't need to move the threads around. What are the disadvantages? What are the disadvantages? I guess we should. We'll spend, we the, spend the rest of the time on figuring out the disadvantages. Figuring out the disadvantages, and then, we'll continue, and then we'll continue from there. There must be a disadvantage. There must be a disadvantage to this. Right? Like, what are you losing? Yes. Like, what are you losing? Yes. Isn't that really bad for your power, like energy consumption? It could be. It could that's be. That's right, because you're increasing the right, voltage, you're increasing increasing the voltage and increasing the frequency. And it may be worse than, and it may designing, be worse a than designing a large right. core. Maybe right. 
But you're not going to enable it. But you're not going to enable any of the other cores. So you, you're not going to uh, you're not going over to shoot uh, your power over shoot your power design the entire system. You design the entire system. Support, support the high frequency operating point. Support the high frequency operating point on a single. And that's what what that's what the Halo and I have power seven. We have power seven. They could allocate. They could allocate the power different cores depending on what frequency is assigned. What else? What else? You can only increase the frequency so much based on your critical mass. There is a limit to what you can I guess that's true. Your design needs to be amenable to increasing frequency. Increasing to very high. Yes. To very high. Yes. Imagine some, uh, some overhead you can maintain with the fact that different cores are running at different clock speeds, so there might be some synchronization mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's yeah. true, especially if the cores are running at higher or whatever. That's right. You need to design your system. That's right. You need to design your system. Your communication is your communication is correct in that case. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You you more be bounded by memory access. That's right. So that's a different way of putting. That's a different way of putting. I'm thinking one of the major disadvantages of this is. Basically, this doesn't help memory performance. This doesn't help memory performance. You're just boosting frequency. Uh, and that improves the performance of your comp if you're computation bound, but it does nothing for your memory. Well, it may do something. You may execute the memory operations more frequently, but it doesn't explicitly help memory performance. And if the thread is memory bound, increasing frequency doesn't help, unless you're going to increase the memory frequency also. This is where a large core that can tolerate memory latency better with prefetching techniques or run ahead or large instruction windows can buy you a lot more performance. Uh, well, the other thing is it doesn't reduce, it's, it helps part of the performance equation, right? You're just playing with frequency. You're not changing cycles per instruction. Even the performance gain you would get uh, on compute computation parts will be limited. And uh, as this paper looked at, changing frequency and voltage at the same time can take longer than switching to a large core. And if you remember this figure, they, they said 100 microseconds versus 10 microseconds. Of course, this is because you need to ramp voltage. So if you don't ramp the voltage, you should just change the frequency. Uh, then you, get, you don't get, this may not be true. But then you may not get the benefits of. You may not be able to achieve higher frequencies because to support higher frequencies, you need higher voltage. Right. OK, so I think we'll stop here and we'll continue uh, with this paper and asymmetry. I guess Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs>